Today, President Biden visited Tulsa to mark the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre, um, which was an attack on Black Wall Street, which killed hundreds of people, destroyed 35 blocks in the city. My question to you is, the president has vowed to reduce racial wealth gap uh, addressing this uh, massacre. What are your comments on it and what do you think is uh, the possible solution with this racial wealth gap? It's uh, about time and it's going to involve corporate America, of course, to reduce the racial uh, wealth gap, as you've put it, and as the president has put it. Uh, there's no denying the fact that there is a huge wealth gap, especially uh, within Wall Street and some of the corporate uh, tycoons around the world, actually, not just here in the United States, but around the world. There is this dichotomy, huge dichotomy between how much... Uh, uh, you know, people from minorities and other races as compared to the whites right. make in terms of salaries and benefits and all the rest of it. Um, and in turn, that leads to a wider gap between the rich and, and those who are not rich. So to put that very mildly, this has been a serious problem for a long time, decades in the making. It's going to take, it's not going to happen overnight, but it's about time that there are some kinds of regulations to make sure now, I, I'm not talking about quotas and things like that, mm -hmm. but some kind of regulation to to sort of be blind to the fact that someone is white, black, brown, yellow, etc., within the corporate structure and the business structure, and that everybody is treated as an equal. This also includes women, in my opinion. Right. Women have also been uh, lagging behind in terms of financial benefit, wherever they have worked within the workforce. And uh, so it's going to have to encompass all of them. But it was a good time to bring this up because this is one of the leading causes mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, people looking down on each other. And I mean, again, anywhere in the world is if you feel you're privileged and you have more wealth, then you look down upon those who don't seem to have enough and think that they're, you know, they need handouts all the time. And that is not the case. I think every human needs dignity. And so the, this, this Tulsa, Tulsa occasion was the most appropriate to bring this matter up. What do you think our communities of color should learn from this massacre that happened? It uh, gives a huge statement for an end to racism, perhaps in the country. Yeah, I don't think racism will ever end. It's been uh, with humanity. Uh, for centuries. You, know, you can go back to Roman history, you can go back to Greek history, you can go back to British history, of course, to Asian history itself, and you will see uh, racial discrimination has been prevalent throughout uh, the existence of humanity. Uh, so it's never going to end. However, because we are intelligent compared to all the others in the animal kingdom, we should be able to ameliorate, uh, ameliorate these circumstances and make life better for everybody. So I think it's going to take uh, a lot of effort uh, f uh, from everyone uh, concerned to bring about racial harmony. But it's going to take, uh, first of all, the recognition that we're all human first right. uh, and color doesn't matter whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, there have been some famous illustrations of people, you know, showing their blood and saying, look, you might be black, I might be white, or I might be black, you might be white. The color of our blood is the same. It all runs through all of us. Right. And that's going to be the unifying factor, I think. But it's going to take a while. Racism is never going to go away completely. Yes, and it's a really good reminder for communities to unite together for that call to end racial justice and to get more into, you know, more justice for all these people. Meanwhile, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce has announced that there is a labor shortage in the country and have come up with this initiative called America Works. How are you looking at the situation and how does this affect the economy? Yeah, first of all, I want to, good question, and I want to bring up the fact that uh, uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce itself and many other businesses and many other business entities around the, the country and Republican-run states have been talking about the COVID relief and the COVID extension of benefits, unemployment benefits, et cetera, okay. having caused this. That is not true. The, the industry is most affected, most affected by the labor shortage right now uh, is hospitality. Hospitality, including hotels, including restaurants and the like, bars and restaurants and things like that. People have forgotten that there has been a whole year of a pandemic when you had to stay away from uh, work for most part, all right? Those jobs in the service industry involving restaurants, hotels, 
paid very, very low wages, very low wages. Take housekeeping in hotels and motels, for instance, very low wages. I know this is going to sound unpopular to a lot of people, but this is a fact. Take restaurants, servers, uh, you know, barbacks, bus boys and bus women, whatever, bus persons, people like that. They've had to live off uh, below minimum wages and depend entirely on tips. Many have had this time in that industry in particular to reflect on what they're doing and whether they need to continue in this business. I have discovered as a reporter myself investigating this, that many of those people serving in those industries have actually moved on to other industries where they get better benefits, better pay. Benefits, by the way, have become very crucial, health benefits in particular, because the pandemic has shown many people who have suffered COVID, ended up in hospitals, and now hospital chains have been suing people, families and individuals, because they couldn't pay those bills for COVID treatment. And all of a sudden, a huge segment of the working population has discovered benefits are extremely important. Lifestyle is extremely important. The meaning of life is extremely important. They've moved on to other areas. And so this labor shortage was also expected because of the pandemic. Many people are afraid to return to the workforce. Many people are still here in New Jersey, for instance. We don't have to wear masks anymore. Yet, I am surprised and pleasantly surprised, by the way. I walk into stores, I walk into the, the, the local convenience store to pick up a coffee, whatever, and I find people wearing the masks anyway. They're all fully vaccinated, they're wearing it, okay? But that psyche that we gotta keep ourselves protected still permeates society. There are a lot of people who will not return to the workforce right now because they feel it's not the right time, even though the governments, state governments, the federal government have said it's fine. Right. They are afraid. It's the same with women and women who form a large part, part of the workforce ha are having a tough time finding people to care for their children and so aren't going back. That's where the labor shortage is. But with the, you know, the uh, issue of reopening happening everywhere across the country, uh, don't you think that would allow uh, more uh, space for this workforce? How will that impact the economy? The economy is going to uh, correct itself pretty soon. I am not, uh, this was all expected in my opinion. I think for people to jump the gun and say, this is the reason, this is the reason is completely wrong. This was fully expected. Uh, stimulus was gonna take time. Stimulus has already uh, got the engines ignited and going in the economy. Now the point is for the labor force to catch up and, and to catch up in, in certain essential pockets and then begin to churn those machines again. It's a natural process. You can't restart an economy overnight. The same thing happened in uh, 2008 when the economy crashed precipitously. It still took time for everything. It took a full 10 years for everything to come back to normal. I don't think that's gonna happen this time around. I think by next year, things will come back to normal. There will be a normal uh, labor force. They will be available. There'll be a lot of new people coming in. And by the way, we're talking about labor shortage. There are a record number of college grads out there who have graduated right. this year who are unemployed. They're not getting any benefits from the federal government or the state government. They've never filed unemployment because they've never been employed. They're looking for work. They do not want to be servers in restaurants. Right. They don't want to be laborers somewhere. They're looking for something better with benefits. There's a whole huge number of students out there graduated looking for work. And unless they're given better salaries, better incentives for the future, they're not going to join the workforce. Is the Biden government, according to you, doing a good job right now with this issue at least? I think it's doing a fantastic job all around. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not, uh, I'm neither Democrat nor Republican, as you know, and I've reminded your viewers, I am an independent and I'm a journalist analyzing things as I see it. I think he's doing a fantastic job. I think he can do better at the border, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, but otherwise overall with the economy and everything else, he is on the right track. And I don't think he's trying to think socialistically as many people are trying to accuse him mm -hmm. of doing, but uh, he's thinking very pragmatically with infrastructure and the rest of it. These are things that have been needed in America for a long, long time and have been ignored for far too many uh, years. Yes, and the GPO, the GOP, sorry, isn't, consistently supporting the president. And right now there are these restrictive voting laws that they keep on working on across many states uh, that are of GOP importance. How are you looking at that fight over voting laws and do you think it'll be restricted under the Biden administration? 
they're basically trying to suppress uh, legitimate voters and, and specifically targeting minority voters. And, and these laws are completely illegitimate, I believe. Um, they think the election was stolen, uh, you know, from Donald Trump. Not true, obviously. We all know that. In fact, there were Republican states that have said no, and there was no fraud, no nothing. This, the elections are perfectly normal. And uh, I think this is just uh, wishful thinking on the part of the GOP control states that are implementing these type of uh, measures. Uh, they, they see it as a good tool to uh, maintain their majority in the future. And that's all it is for them. This is highly political. It is highly politically biased. Uh, these maneuvers are anti-democratic, in my opinion, not anti-democratic party, but anti-democratic period, and uh, should not be implemented at all. Right. Um, what do you think the Biden government is going to do to, uh, you know, combat this issue? There's not much it can do because uh, each state is uh, on its own, essentially. Um, the federal government is uh, uh, more, uh, you know, a national uh, administrator in things like uh, defense and foreign policy and uh, the national economy or put together that type of thing. But states do have their freedom to enact their own laws etc. Now those laws can be challenged in various courts uh, by those who detract from them. Those laws can be challenged in federal courts as well. And ultimately something like this would go to the Supreme Court. We hope it doesn't get to that stage. I don't think the Biden administration can really do much. Mm. Uh, it can't go after every single state that chooses to enact these laws. Um, but perhaps I might be wrong at some point in the future. And they might come up with a solution uh, to legislate this, and that would involve Congress and the Senate. And they might be able to do that, but I think it's a long shot. Another big issue concerning the nation, uh, Mr. Vyas, is the issue of mass shootings. We've actually seen more than 200 mass shootings this year just by itself. How are you looking at this issue? And, you know, when do you think we'll have some sort of gun reform? Gun reform is, again, something that's been on the table for a long time. It's been resisted by those who believe in the Second Amendment. What they all forget is the Second Amendment was uh, way back when the, when the country was born, when the United States uh, attained its freedom, uh, when it was one of the fundamental rights. But it was a different time period. Uh, you did not have the fundamental right to hold on to assault rifles and uh, shoot in a crowd and just massacre people. That was a right to defend oneself to defend oneself in case of undue, uh, you know, attacks uh, from any kind of a source, but they were never meant to be used to kill people at random. And that's where the problem is. That's where the misunderstanding uh, of the Second Amendment has been for so many years and decades indeed. Um, there's going to have to be gun reform, whether we like it or not. Uh, a lot of people will say, well, it's not the weapon that commits the crime, it's the uh, person. Well, unfortunately, we have a lot of people who are not mentally uh, stable and capable of owning weapons and holding on to them and controlling their urges to suddenly go berserk. And so, therefore, there will have to be legislation to control uh, who gets a weapon, what kind of weapon, etc. I think there's going to have to be a ban on certain types of weapons, weaponry, such as assault rifles, um, you know, things which which have automatic, uh, you know, uh, uh, bullets that can just go through, you know, hundreds of bullets at a time and massacre large cards. I mean, how many reminders do we need now? As you pointed out, we've had so many incidents as this year began, and it's 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 become ridiculous. We've become uh, we're being ridiculed by the rest of the world right now. Um, in fact, sometimes, unfortunately, I don't see any difference between what's happening in the United States and what's happening in some of the other countries we accuse of being uh, running wild. Uh, it's the same thing here. Just look at our own uh, backyard, what's going on. Right. Do you think the Biden administration in their term of years would be able to tackle this? Or do you see this fight continue to happen? I think they're going to attempt to tackle it within this term. They're going to attempt to do something. The president has reminded everyone, just look at this. Look at what's happening in our country. And he's the one that used the term that we have uh, been the object of ridicule around the world. And he says, it's, it's, you don't need any more proof than this. Every single day we hear of something else. It's become so that now it's not even news anymore. And that's the dangerous part and the sad part. Yeah. It's not even news anymore. No, oh, another mass shooting. Yeah, you know, that's become the uh, societal attitude yeah. 
toward this type of news breaking now. You don't hear people being that disturbed anymore. And, and so before uh, society gets uh, jaded enough to start accepting this as normal, uh, action will be needed very urgently. And I think the Biden administration, to answer your question, is going to do its best to enact some kind of law uh, within this term. Right, and just looking at the Biden administration, they're also trying to investigate the origins of COVID. Um, China has remained pretty much silent on where the you know coronavirus originated from. What do you think it shows uh, you know about China not being able to give a proper answer? And how important do you think they need to, it is to find the origins? What does that mean if they found it? An important thing to mention here <clears throat> is when we talk about China, we're talking about the Chinese state. We're talking about the communists who are in control of China, not the Chinese people. I think a lot of people have not understood that when they say China, they blanket the entire population as uh, you know, being quiet and et cetera. That's not true. It is the state, the Chinese, the Chinese state, which controls everybody and everything in that country. So we have to understand that first. They are by nature, by their creation and by their doctrine, extremely secretive. They are by their nature, authoritarian. And they, uh, I think it, there are two possibilities that this was either an accidental uh, escape of a virus that was being worked on at the Wuhan lab, or it was deliberate, uh, something that was engineered, something that Donald Trump sort of implied. Right. Uh, he didn't imply one way or the other, but he implied, he called it the China virus. And in that, uh, in this particular case, he was absolutely right in my opinion, by calling it the China virus. Now to call it the China virus actually is wrong, but he should have said the Chinese state virus. And that would have made a whole big difference in my opinion. But the fact is, uh, this needs to be investigated. I don't think we're ever going to get to the bottom of it entirely. It is going to be upon left to the world's uh, remaining scientists to try and break down the genome of this virus and figure out what it really is. But you can tell just by the way it is mutating and mutating very unnaturally yeah, and extremely true. fast, unlike the flu, for instance, unlike other viruses that have been around. This one is mutating in strange ways and extremely fast to suggest, in my opinion, nobody else's, but my own opinion, that it's been engineered. And whether it escaped or has been uh, let loose deliberately, we'll, we'll have to see. Yeah, but it's so important for them to find these origins, so at least we know what exactly happened. It's such a mystery virus. I just have two more questions left here for you. India is still getting devastated by the COVID crisis there. Um, they're saying the cases are getting a little better and they're dropping in numbers. However, it's spreading all across the country, the rural parts and so on and so forth. Um, what role do you think the United States could play in helping India? And the amount of help that, the, that they have already sent, do you think that's enough? It's never enough. Obviously, India is uh, the second most populous nation on, on the planet. And therefore, any, any help that's sent will never be enough. It'll be uh, left to uh, the uh, to India itself to deal with it. I want to point out here something. A lot of the media around the world have been very critical of the government of India, right. the one led by Prime Minister Modi in this. People forget or, or will not talk about the fact that India and the United States have very similar governing situations. We have discussed um, the situation of COVID here in the United States during the course of this pandemic. You and I have talked about it. Just like here in the United States, the federal government allocates what it can to all the states in the United States. It is then up to the states to individually implement programs uh, to get relief, to get help, to get oxygen, ventilators, vaccines and the like to its population. That's how it works in the United States. It's very similar in India, actually exactly the same in India, just a different uh, way of calling the government. Over there, it's the central government. Here, it's the federal government. And in India, it's the states, like here the states, but the states over there have their own administrations, which are elected. They have their chief ministers and their cabinets. Many of them are not from the same party, just like here in the United States. So the federal government, the central government in India did allocate from the very outset of this uh, pandemic, uh, supplies, medical supplies, etc., to all the states. The states then had the freedom to implement what was needed to various hospitals and institutions and to clusters of COVID cases uh, on their own. 
That's where the failure occurred. It is not a, fe- a centrally administered uh, thing. So a lot of, I just wanted to point that out here because a lot of media have blamed the Indian government, the national government for this, but the national government had no role in this other than to ensure that everything went to all the states. Now, what the states did with everything is up to them. Uh, however, of course, uh, talking about mutations, India has been facing uh, a very, very uh, you know, dangerous mutation of its own over there and is fighting very hard. People forget the population that's there in India, 1.5 billion plus. And it's not an easy task. We all know what happened right here in the United States. We can use this as a perfect example. We saw people being left out in freezer trucks, bodies being piled up there in various cities here in the United States, New York City, Los Angeles, um, you know, up in uh, Chicago, Detroit, you name them, uh, down in Texas. There were so many cases of the same type of thing we saw early on in the pandemic here. And India is going through its uh, second phase, which happens to be horrible. But the numbers have come down and hopefully they're getting a handle on things over there. Right, for sure. You know, there's always this hope that hopefully we will be away from this pandemic very soon, you know, if everything goes well. And here's Mm -hmm. hoping the best for India. My last question to you is actually, I would love for you to discuss some of the top stories that our audience should follow this week for the rest of the week. I think one of the most important stories uh, right now is, uh, you know, uh, uh, this girl, uh, Naomi Osaka, right. the uh, tennis champion. And uh, the the fact that her plight has uh, highlighted mental issues. Now, mental issues, of course, as you know, have risen during the pandemic. So that's a whole separate topic by itself. But sports persons, prominent personalities facing mental problems is a, is a particular type of tragedy. And I think uh, the world needs to start looking at mental issues as a real, real serious illness that needs sympathy, support, and full medical help and social help. It's not something to be treated lightly. It is something extremely serious. We're seeing so much of it now, as I mentioned, because of the pandemic. But uh, Naomi Osaka in particular, uh, in 2018, she won the US Open tennis tournament. I saw that tournament. And it was a very, very riveting moment and a very uh, emotional moment because the uh, the, the umpire, the court umpire had ruled uh, against uh, Serena Williams, against whom uh, Naomi Osaka was playing at the time in the the final. And uh, the crowd began to boo uh, the referee, the umpire. And Naomi won that uh, particular tournament. She won, but she, she took it personally, it would seem to me, as if they were, uh, you know, booing her. She knew they weren't, but it was, it somehow would have reflected as a sort of failure on her part that she didn't really win the tournament fair and square. And that we now learn has obviously bothered her to this day. And then we find her withdrawing from the French Open because she refused to meet with the media, uh, meeting her obligations as a tennis star to, uh, you know, give press conferences, etc. But it highlighted the plight of those who suffer from the uh, you know, mental uh, mental health issues a very, very. So I think that's the biggest story right now. And I think it should cause a massive uh, deal of awareness among all of us to start watching all of this. Also, I think the biggest stories we should be following are um, the fact that there are still lockdowns in many parts of the world. Just today, it's been revealed that Malaysia has instituted a very strict lockdown for the next couple of weeks. It may go on for a long time because there's another severe mutation over there. There's a severe mutation of COVID in Vietnam, mm. um, also in we here in Thailand. India, of course, you're all aware of. Uh, Europe itself, Britain itself, is considering uh, more stringent lockdown measures because they're finding mutations coming in there. The, they, they're saying the Indian one has now reached uh, British shores, right. and that is causing concern. Australia, uh, in Victoria, the province of Victoria, they are facing... Um, a new surge in COVID. So I think that's going to continue to be a major case, which again leads to what kind of virus are we dealing with? Is this a human engineered virus or is it natural? Doesn't seem natural to me. So these are two issues I think that will have to be studied besides the economy, the global health, uh, the the economy of the global uh, situation.